Welcome to this event, uh, the documentary in September Canta el Gallo. Muchas gracias a todos y a todas por estar acá, de verdad. It's very important for us to have you here. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for your patience. We just came uh, from the airport with Nano. We're super happy and super excited for being able to have him here to give us the opportunity to share with all of you this documentary that it's a pre-release and in a super important moment and context of our, our story, some people also here, uh, because uh, 50 years ago, uh, it was the coup d'etat in Chile. Uh, and this is a huge opportunity for us like to be together to to share a little bit of our history uh, through the voices of people that lived in in those times and from a perspective that it's not the one that we're most used to that sadly uh, and very often it's it seems to be like the just like the sad part because of the horrors that happened during this process. But now we can have the opportunity to listen to the voices of the ones that use their voices, their instruments, to try to dream on a different world, not just for Chile, but for the peoples everywhere. Uh, today also, it's a super important date for Chile. Uh, on 2019, there was the, the social a revolt in Chile to try to change the basics from the constitution that then became a, a complicated story, an ongoing story, an ongoing struggle and fight that we need to keep uh, fighting for. Uh, but at least we change, we stop the things that started with the coup and that we are, we are still living, but it's a commemoration for the people that fought during and against the dictatorship for the ones that fought during the revolt of 2019. Uh, also, it's the birthday of uh, our grandmother with Tommy that passed away some years ago, who also was a, a, a social activist, uh, a woman that fought against the dictatorship. Uh, so it's a personal moving day then. Thank you so much for being here and we also wanted to, we want to tell you about a new project. Just one minute to share with yeah. all of you. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Nano, to give us the opportunity to inaugurate this project, which is Rio Junto. Uh, this is a project that uh, wants to create some spaces for cultural exchange. Uh, this is going to be the first activity that we are going to be doing. Uh, and you will have some news soon. Uh, thanks uh, to the Department of Spanish Studies uh, for the support, uh, the Department of Music, the, the, the GLUC program, uh, the cultural me Media and Cultural Studies, and Latino and Latin American Studies Center. Okay, so uh, thank you all for supporting this uh, event that is very important for us. Thank you all our friends Latin friends, non-Latin friends. Uh, this is a piece for, from our history. And also thank you for the students of Spanish, which is very important that you are here. So I think we have to introduce Nano. Please come. Nano, please. For, for Nano, please. Yeah. We just came from Portland. here to share this with all of us. Bueno, muchas gracias. Thank you all for the invitation. How many of you don't speak Spanish? Uno, dos, tres, yeah, muy poquito. So you will have to read subtitles, which is something that we grew up doing all our lives, so it's a, a little bit of minority feeling one time. <laughs> uh, well, um, I'm really happy that we can show this film today. Uh, we met with Nico, it was the most in incredible story. We met in the non-ending queue at the U.S. Embassy in Santiago de Chile. 
where they have you waiting for five hours there and they take your phone away so you actually have to talk to someone no? <laughs> and we just happened to be next in line so we started slowly and then goodbye and we said it as we went out so he said could we do this could we do this film I said maybe the 18th of October then we looked 18th of October what a day what a date and here we are two months later so yeah. muchas gracias and I don't have much to say before the film I would rather we start and we can have some more time to talk about it at the end um, just uh, enjoy it's a very inspiring story I think yes we'll talk later okay yeah Nano came just to share with us the screening, but he's going to do an exception for us, so if you stay until the end, he's going to also finish with a song. So he brought the guitar, he will sing one live song for all of you. Thank you so much for joining us in this event. Now we're going to have a short conversation with Nano and then he will give us a song to close the, the event. We know that it's late, thank you for staying. Uh, we want to have like a short conversation with you, hopefully, if you want to participate. Um, when I saw this documentary back in Chile, and you invited me there, uh, it was a super different approach of what sadly we're used to see and when we are approaching this harsh uh, time, because it brings us also part of the joy that you can see how the, the arts I, are shining of these dreams and, and this exploration, like from teenagers exploring music, how uh, is the, this the creation of this new Chilean song that it's then become something with the new Latin American song. Uh, and what I really think that it, this is particular is that this is a documentary made with Lucho Diseño, the other co-director, and you as a contemporary musician from Chile. Uh, and I really feel that it's a documentary made with this approach. And how was it for you? And what was like your vision? And how did this project start? Yeah, so uh, we, we set out from the beginning not to play by the standard book. No? As you say, most, most of the material surrounding the history of Chile in this time focuses on the coup or on the dictatorship, the martyrdom, the torture, the suffering, and very much also on the resistance to the dictatorship, exile, both in exile and in Chile, and the recovery of democracy, if you want to call it. No? Um, but very few investigations uh, deal with the time itself. And, and even fewer of these works deal with creativity and arts in those times. And I think that um, well, we wanted to not to miss the opportunity to, to learn this story. It's for, for us, it's something very personal. No? I, for me, this is not an academic uh, approach. I am no academic myself. I'm a musician. Lucho, the other director, also is, is we are, none of us are musicologists or journalists or investigators formally. No? But all of our life, we've dealt with this, so we're in love with this music. Personally, I have the, the privilege to call all of these people in the film my colleagues now, and many, most of them, really almost all my friends also. So it was a very close thing to talk to them. I think also that enabled us to talk in such an open way, because uh, many of the things that they say, they had never said before. They wouldn't say to just a to journalist or someone with a, with a colder approach. This was very personal. And, and so first we wanted to to rescue these testimonies before it was too late. So the 50 years context was a good catalyzer for us. Like, okay, now we do it, but also now we do it because they are dying. It's true, I mean, for the 60 years anniversary, I, I would bet you 100 bucks, you know, that 90% of them will be dead probably. It's so, it is so urgent that uh, uh, three people in our original list of interview died during this process and we couldn't, no? So, so there's this urgency to do it now. Um, but there is also two other reasons. There is some sort of parallel with what we're living now in Chile. Today is a good day to speak about that. We had such hopes for change. It's not turning out to be what we hoped, but also didn't turn out then, you know, for different reasons in different ways. But I personally, after leaving the, the social uh, protest, and, which were so intense, 
in, in terms of using music as a means of protesting against something, I was also curious, so how did these people do when, it, when they won the government? No? And, and what did they do now? The same questions that they were asking. So for me personally, I wanted to go ask them. No? But the third, and I think most, most important thing, is more a political decision. It's no coincidence, no? it's not just because that there is so little material about this time. And it has to do, I think, with the uncomfortable truth for the previous generations that lived through those times to have to deal with a sense of self-criticism. It's hard, because I think they have constructed their identity as martyrs of the time and as heroes of the fight against the dictatorship. But dealing with that time, actually, before the coup, implies a certain degree of honesty. What did they do? And what would they think they did right? Which were the mistakes? You know, And that it plays much less into their, into their uh, relato. Narrative, exactly. So it was important, I think, to go and do this. And it is uh, completely understandable, and I don't judge in any way, that the stories told by that generation themselves are more focused around the immense pain and suffering that they experienced, having lost so many friends, having been tortured and exiled, and having also lost a dream and the project, which was at the center of their lives. So I understand that. But I think for our generation, it is it is uh, it would be pointless to insist on the same, no? And it would be dishonest also. So it is important to do to look from other angle. And just one last thing: we were so happy you were there on the first premiere, which was in a very low, a very heavy place. The first time we showed it was at the Victor Cara Stadium, where he was murdered, no? which is now a memory site. It's a museum and it's a very dark energy place, no? But as you see on the film, it is the same place where many things happened before, no? So to show this film for the first time there was sort of, a, a, it had a little bit of a ritualistic um, purpose, no? And people understood it that way, and I think a lot of people in Chile, of course, the impact there is much stronger. It's very emotional for everyone. People sing the songs during the shows and during the filming. Uh, but um, the overall comment was, that people are so thankful to be able to close sort of this commemoration of the 50 years with a material like this that, that gives some sort of connection with the happiness and the hope and the creativity of a time that was, for the most, very beautiful. You know? we, we also very on purpose decided to end the film with the coup, not extend any anymore. And also, if you realize the coup uses very little in the film, it's a very abrupt ending. It's all in all like three minutes since Isabel says that Fidel said you're all gonna get killed and then and it's over. No? Because from a story, from a narrative perspective, storytelling, uh, no, we, we have to take some distance. We thought about this more in abstract terms and, and, and the point being was everyone knows how this story ends. No? That's pretty much the only thing that everyone knows about this story, the ending. So once you announce the ending, it's predictable and unnecessary. No? It's the rest which is important. I think that leaves the film. Of course, the ending is dis disturbing and it leaves you, no, uh, it moves you. But for the most, it is a film about about creativity, about uh, about uh, youth in in every way. Thank you, Nana. And now we're going to open the mic for all of you. Don't be shy, please come up. Be sure, you have something interesting. Raise your hand, Ali. <laughs> yeah. so, so one of the things that, I, that, that struck me um, from, from I think the beginning when uh, they talk about the, the, the creation of Nueva Canción Chilena as something that comes from Paris. Okay, there's, a, there's a wonderful interview there where he's like, you know, in, uh, we were at a talk uh, last Friday where Horacio uh, Legras colleague from Irvine made the case that all Latin Americanism starts in Paris. Mm -hmm. like you, all the, uh, but the, so, I mean, there, there's that sort of original moment of displacing the kind of discourse about origins, about right, uh, the, the, the traditions, which is part of this, but always right with this kind of uh, like the, the incorporation of the electronic, the, the rock, the, the blocks, the mm -hmm. I mean, there, there seemed to be a constant there. Like, I think a lot of the, the discussion around Parra, 
you know, the Genesis returned to the roots, and yet what we see here is this kind of opening up and integration of different styles of music. Mm. More comments? Yeah, mm -hmm. awesome. But I agree, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's interesting that nowadays, if you ask in Chile people, most people know, what is Chilean folk music? They will say Inti Imani, Los Jaivas, no? folk music. And yeah, the first, my first reaction is to say, no, you're all wrong. <laughs> but then I think, well, if 99% of the people answer what is folk music with the same answer, perhaps it, the fact that it changes, no? and that now actually it becomes. And it also sheds some light, perhaps, to how previous music and previous culture and manifestations that we think to be folk or to be the original or to be the pure form, whatever, they never are. You know? it, there is no such thing. It's just now we have the chance to, it's documented no? and it's recorded. And it's pretty much, it's, we are the first generation that can adopt as our own tradition something that we know the birth of because it's recorded. No? That's very interesting. It's a big change, I think, for going forward also. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to express how um, I love how you portrayed really the general beauty of music. I feel like when I think of music, I think of people relating, and it's just so beautiful how a group of people could come together to enjoy something that beauty can be so simple, people coming together. And like with Victoria Hara, for example, she used her voice and she used her art to really show what is happening to the people in Chile. Um, the poverty, the violence, and um, from, like you were saying, a lot of history doesn't isn't accurate, um, and it doesn't really, we don't really learn a lot about these things until they're like shown to us, so I appreciate you sharing your culture and the history of these musicians, and yeah. Thank you, thank you. It's, it's also interesting to learn history, not only from the big, big things, no, from the who was the president and what laws did he pass? No? I think you can learn much, so much more or besides no, with things like this. First of all, congratulations. Thank you. Like, I'm, I'm still kind of doing the picture. <laughs> so, uh, it, yeah, I, I just sort of want to second some of what you were saying about how much the, uh, like, I, I'm an ethnomusicologist, I work in the Andes, I live in South America. Um, and the, the idea of needing to rescue Victor Hada from his martyrdom today is such a conversation that keeps happening, and, and you do it so beautifully here. So congratulations. I can't wait to use this in classes and <laughs> all kinds of other things. The question I wanted to ask, and some of it comes from working mostly in the northern Andes, or at least from the Chilean perspective, the northern Andes, um, in Peru, in Bolivia, and Ecuador, where the relationship with Nueva Canción is really complicated, because on the one hand, there's a a deep love for figures like Diego de Papa, Victor Hada, Inti Dimani, etc. And then all kinds of feeling of sort of nationalist protection of they stole our music and they did this other stuff with it. And even people who maybe politically don't agree with the project of Nueva Canción hearing a version of Bolivian, Chilean, Peruvian uh, music. So I'm curious if you have shown this yet elsewhere in Latin America and what some of the responses might be and how much of that Latin Americanismo in contrast with nacionalismo and, yeah. and the other things that come out. So. so actually it's interesting. The very first time that we showed this film, it was not even finished. We hadn't done post-production, there was not the graphics, it was just more raw. No? The first time was in La Paz, in Bolivia. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who don't know, there is a lot of, of problems. No, It's a very complex relationship even more so from Bolivia towards Chile, also from Chile to Bolivia, but in Bolivia it's very intense because there was a war and Chile, Chile not really, but to, to say it in very simple terms, Chile won not really, but yes. So there is a lot of resentment, and, and, but the response was beautiful. It was a crowd that was interested, no? and it was a very intimate and beautiful thing, but it, was, it opened up for very good conversation. So a couple of things about that, which I'm curious about your opinion, being, being in your much more than my field. No? Um, so the first thing is that if this would try to happen now, people like Inti Imani or Kilabayun would be accused with cultural appropriation, and rightly so. No? I think they were not expecting that that in 2023, no, you could uh, you could listen to records, for example, of Lojairas, no? because it is like I always grew up with this thing that yeah, I, I'd heard from them before that they were criticized for playing sort of Bolivian music and that 
and that the charango was not an instrument from Chile. But for me, this was kind of, yeah, sure, people exaggerated. No? Until this year, when I went, I, I got myself a couple of those Jairas albums, the first ones, which you don't find in Chile, and they're not uploaded anywhere. And so I start hearing, and I hear a couple of songs that I know from Inti Nivani or Kilbayun. It's not like the song, it's exactly the same. It's like a cover band, you know? It's the same arrangement, same pitch, same thing, same vocal, 100%, you know? And so I said, well, yeah, they actually really, uh, they started copying. But then, as, as an artist myself, I say, but which other way is there to start? You know? So the one part that I, that I come across with, and this is what I'm curious your opinion, is the relationship of, of the youth in England in the late 50s and 60s with the blues from the US and the black musicians, which was exotic, which was rebellious, which was different, you know? In this case, more sexual in the Andes music, different, but it was rebellious. It had to do with Che Guevara there also fighting and going through the continent. It had to do with Latin Americanismo. So I think it's a similar thing. It's a reaction of this youth in a sort of disoriented uh, cultural context, you know, with doubts about their own identity, wanting to rebel against something and drawing from a culture that is sort of more roots even, no, and more rural and and, and, and draws on a, on a certain fantasy aspect. I think it has a lot to do with that. I, I always wondered, how come, why did Andes music appeal the revolutionary youth? No? What was it about that music? So there's Paris, yeah, which is true, but also it goes beyond. And I think that's, there's something there to investigate, which is, uh, which is very interesting. But then um, you, you see that later on, what happened in Chile with the Nueva Canción, has a great influence in the music of the Andes countries you know, now. For example, Iyapu, you know, which comes along at the end of the film because of the simple fact that they were much younger and they started in 72. But, so this is a very funny story and, and teaches me a lot as a musician, you know, how to look at music history and at the big monoliths of music. So Iyapu is the most important Andes uh, music band in Chile and it is very popular in Ecuador, Bolivia, and Peru. Almost the only one. In Tijimani, bit less, and Kilabayun, much less. But Iyabu is a popular band. They go and they fill stadiums in Quito, and in Bolivia they play with Ojarca. They are, and they are so popular that their, their style has really crossed the borders. And there is many bands in all of these countries that sing as they do. And they sing in a very special way, which is this usually five-part vocal arrangements with a very wide range, so very low and very high. It's very characteristic of them. I thought that this was some tradition that they had incorporated, you know, that this is the way, because since I'm born, it, this is the way. And if like a bunch of kids do a Andes music band now, they will immediately start arranging like that, because it's so deep in your, that's how it's done. You know? Pretty much as if you do a, a rock band, you know, you're gonna start harmonizing like the Beatles, because it's deep in our collective. You know? So then I, in this interview, it, it didn't make it to the film. Keep in mind that there is 50 minutes of film, of interviews in the 90 minutes of film, and there is 50 hours of interviews on film, so times 60, you know, a lot of material. So he said, when we were young, we were all brothers in the band, the Marquez brothers. So when we were young, we were, we, we were into rock and roll, really. And our mom's favorite band was the Platters. So they grew up listening to the Platters, which are car main characteristic is this five, voice arrangements, and they learned all the platters arrangements. And then when they were older in their teenage years and becoming interested in the Andes music, naturally, how did they do it? Like the platters. Mm -hmm. So this very random fact that their mom liked the platters and that they learned this music as kids and then that they, without prejudice, approach one music with another aesthetic, in this case coming from the US, which is so weird, ended up becoming the new standard in all the region, not only in Chile. So this is fascinating, you know, how intercultural uh, exchange goes in such unexpected ways and can have such deep impact given the right uh, circumstances. So yeah, very interesting and complex uh, relationship there. Okay, yeah. next question. Hi, um, I love this documentary. I think it is in, um, incredible. I love it for um, the same reason that you highlighted, right, that it is very much about the joy of the art of the effervescence of the coming together and the way that the people that are interviewed, their eyes are still lighting up. That's so 50 true. 50 years yeah. later, they're still yes. like channeling all of that, right? 
So I did a little bit of um, work uh, some years, a few years ago, about an, uh, an uprising in Oaxaca uh, in 2006, where it seemed like a lot of the Nueva Canción, a lot of that same kind of fervor was being reactivated again. And I was really interested in the way that that joy traveled from the early 70s Chile to Oaxaca, Mexico, right? Um, through, through that music. So, so for me, this is a, a beautiful documentary that really highlights you know, how that lives on despite the, the maybe momentary tragedy right, of, the, of the dictatorship and the coup mm -hmm. and the violence. Um, but I want to ask something else, which, is, which might have to do a little bit also with what you just said, that you have 50 hours of, of interview material in there. Right? The editing in this film is wonderful. It's very dynamic. It's uh, like it's really professional, really well put together, and um, the archival work that you guys have done is unbelievable. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about that process yeah. of getting into the archives and of how you made the choices of what to include in, in terms yes. of imagery. So first, and I'll be very clear about this. That those two aspects of the film are the ones that I had the least to do, and so I'm very sad my friends are not here. No, I'm, I'm very happy that because I feel the same. No? When I when I started, I'm not a filmmaker. So um, Lucho, my my co-director, so we did it really both of us. He comes more from the visual world. <coughs> He's a stop motion artist, so all of those animations, you know, he did. <coughs> and then we started researching together. What can you do about archive? No, and so we started going everywhere. The national television. It's hard because there is not so much art. No, there's very little material because to start there was little material uh, filmed at the time. Chile was a very remote place. Um, more, there was more interest towards the government of Allende, so you start seeing more and more material. But at the beginning, it was very hard to find. The 1950s, no one cared about Chile, no one went. There were no cameras there, no television until 69, no television. So. Uh, but yeah, we went around institutions, many the universities. We were um, blessed by the collaboration of of the of the Universidad de Santiago, which is now what used to be the Technica, so the main one that's portrayed there. Also, the families of Victor Jara and Violeta Barra that I was like because I, I knew them from my work as a musician, and we had a good trust, so they they let us use it. No, the same for the music. There's 36 songs, which. Uh, you guys in California, you probably know more about the film business than me, but that's very expensive. And we got it for nothing, no? because we just said, listen, we don't have any resources. No one gave us money, not the government, no one at all. So uh, it's just a matter of you know, uh, working around it. But uh, so once we got all the material, um, then it went to Darío Ordenes, who, who is the, the, edit, the, the montajista, the editor, and he did an outstanding job. No? But the one thing, I mean, Lucho and I, we did a script very clear, so we had a very clear idea of how the film should run, and we decided from the very beginning that it should be dynamic, um, that we would have no voiceover, which I think is a very important thing. It's a sort of it's a big difference. No, there's no one telling you what to think or and now happened this and then no, it's just them. No, um, and the third thing was that we were very clear that this film has to reflect the pop uh, aspect of what happened, not only popular but pop. You know as in youthful and attractive and fast and changing. The, the actual, um, so getting into more detail, the rhythm of the film accelerates. You know? This is something I've, I've seen it like 500 times in the last two months. So <laughs> in the first time, maybe you don't realize. But it starts, it's slower because it's slower times. You know? The countryside, but towards the end, it's more and more, more, boom, 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 bah, you know? and then it ends in a blast, literally. So all of this were, were, was the work of Dario, who's brilliant. And uh, he tells a very funny story. The pity he cannot tell you, but I tell you. He says that he's done a lot of things, work for Netflix, and he's very professional, like high level. Uh, so at the beginning of, of this year, in January, he said uh, he had a meeting. He's the director of a little office there of editing. And he said, guys, this year, we're going to make money. Fuck the arts and the projects and the nice things that we need to make money, so we're going to work with publicity and this and this. And unless someone comes knocking the door that they're doing the documentary on Victor Jara. <laughs> this was in January, so in March we knocked the door and said, <laughs> and here we are. No? And so we're all poorer but happier. <laughs> and I'm glad that you can tell that it's a very professional and, and, and it's a dynamic. You know? uh, yeah, cool. Yes, thank you.
you can drink bad wine, but if it's cheap, it's good. You know? <laughs> we, one of the guys from Indy Money said, you know the problem these days, thinking about back then, is when you make a project now, the first meeting, the first issue on the table is the budget. So not, nothing gets done because it's impossible. You have to do it and then fuck it. You somehow, no, you <laughs> I'm gonna sing to you, of course, a song by Victor Jara, who I'm paying tribute this whole year. I recorded an album of his music, and uh, this is a very beautiful song, very significant as well, called Luchin, which is the name of a kid, Lucho, Luis, Luchin, the little Luis. And uh, this is a true story. Victor went to do some volunteering work in a slum in the, in the north of Santiago, Pudahuel, Barrancas, it was called back then. And he found this kid who was abandoned and in very bad shape, and he adopted him. He took him with him first to the university, and they cared for him there, but after some weeks, he said it's not going to work, and he took him to his house, and he lived as the son of Victor Jara for, for a couple of years um, until the day of the coup. And then, of course, Victor was murdered, and Joan, his wife, was English, so she went with her daughter to England. And, and Lucin was then adopted by a lawyer, the family of a lawyer. And now he's alive. He's not even that old, 58 or something, uh, less, 56. And he's a lawyer as well, but he works uh, defending homeless kids, mm -hmm. from the, which I think is very beautiful. And then, so I was, um, I was uh, procrastinating in Instagram. Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks after releasing the album, I was watching videos of cats, what, what I do a lot, <laughs> more than I wish. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I get a message in Instagram saying, hey, Nano, this is Lucin. It was the fucking real Lucin, you know, in Instagram. It was so weird. It was surreal. And he said, I listened to your album. It was so moving. I want to thank you for bringing back the songs of Victor in such a beautiful way. And I was moved. Then he came to the release concert. He brought me a little present, gave me a hug. And now he, he WhatsApps me all the time. How's the tour going? Yeah, go. Mm -hmm. Very... Uh, but beyond the anecdote, I think that it, is, uh, it's, it shows us you know, that the sons of Victor are literally living amongst us. No? It's not something of the remote past, they're part of our lives. So, I hope you enjoy. Um... 